Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning, especially after last week where I know a lot of people were snowed in, uh, but it's good to see that we've been able to get out today and are here with us this morning. Um, I wanted to start this morning with a quote, um, and it is, the end is reconciliation, the end is redemption, the end is the creation of the beloved community. It is the type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. The type of love that I stress here is not eros, a sort of aesthetic or romantic love, not philia, a sort of reciprocal love between personal friends, but it is agape, which is understanding goodwill for all men. It is an overflowing love which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. This is the love that may well be the salvation of our civilization. That quote, if you don't know it, is from Dr. Martin Luther King. Tomorrow, uh, as a country, we will be celebrating Martin Luther King Day. And uh, one of the things that normally occurs on Martin Luther King Day across the country is there are things called days of service, where groups get together and they perform acts of service. They clean up a park, uh, they, they visit those that are sick or in need, but they do acts of servitude towards their community, which I thought was appropriate to talk about, given our theme is ready for service. So one thing I want to talk about this morning, and it is in response to this quote, is the idea of the beloved community. And I want to talk specifically how the idea and the creation of a beloved community lends itself to service. And how if we're going to be a beloved community, if we're going to be a community that loves each other, how that's something that will show up in how we serve. And I think that is something we should focus on, something we should try to create. A community that loves each other is something we should strive for as a church. So I'm going to start today in John chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 34. We're going to move a little bit around in John chapter 13. We're going to start at verse 34 and read 34 and 35. A lot of people look behind me, so I'm like, is it up there? I'm not sure. I need a mirror in the back, Don. Can we get that? <laughs> so in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So Jesus here gives the command to his apostles. Uh, this is at the, the Last Supper, at where he has instituted earlier in this chapter, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus says, this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And he says, this is how you're to be known. This is how people are to know you, by your love for one another. I thought about this, and I thought about how people are known as something. And I think if we think about our groups of friends, or maybe the people we work with, there's the sports guy or there's the math guy, or there's the one who, who always corrects people's grammar. You know, people are known by something. People are typically, oh yeah, that's the guy that you know, always has a mint. You know, they're known for something. And Jesus here is saying that we should be known as people who love one another. And I think this, is, uh, this, this idea of being known by something uh, isn't you know, isn't foreign to gospel times, that, that occurred as well in biblical times. If you think about Barnabas, whose real name was Joseph, but why was he called Barnabas? Because he was a son of encouragement. He was such an encourager that they changed the name they called him, to son of encouragement. People are known by something. They're known for something. And Jesus says that as his disciples, as the people that follow him, were to be known as people who love one another. I don't think it's surprising here that the word that Jesus uses here is agape. It's that word that, that Martin Luther King says will be the salvation of our civilization, that type of, of selfless love. He, Jesus wants us to be known as the people that, oh, that church, that's the one that really loves one another and loves other people. Embedded in that command in verse 34, he says, even as I have loved you. Jesus showed them how to love. He showed them what that love looked like. And he hadn't, just, he hadn't just shown it throughout his ministry, but he had just shown it to them. 
So if you turn back in chapter 13 to verse 12, this, Jesus had just performed an act. He had just washed the apostles' feet. And in verse 12, he says, So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. It's interesting to me that after Jesus gets done with this, he, he sits down back at the table. He goes, Do you realize what just happened? Do you understand what just occurred? He says, if I am Lord and Master, and you are right in saying that, what did I just do? He just washed their feet. It was custom in that time for the host to typically give water for, the, for their visitors to wash their own feet, and sometimes they would even give a servant to wash their feet. It was extremely uncommon for the host or the Lord or the Master of that particular place to actually do that. The only other time that we were looking through, trying to find uh, some other examples of this, uh, in 1 Samuel 13, there is an example of Abigail washing the feet of the messengers of David. And that was a humbling experience for her. That was to show that they were honored in her sight. But typically, it was a servant that did that. So, da so uh, Jesus here is saying, do you realize what I just did? The Lord, the master, the teacher that you call me, I humbled myself and served you. A couple weeks ago when uh, Dave was speaking about humility as we kicked off this series or as we kicked off the, the theme, he talked about how humility plays a part in service. How putting others above yourself is essential if we want to have a heart of service. And I think Jesus here is reiterating that, but he adds a little something to it and hope. I can add a little something as well, what he's talking about here. So if you continue on in verse 15, it says, For I gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus flat out tells them, this is an example you're to follow. Oftentimes, we look at, we look at the life of Jesus, we see the things he does, he has done, and we say that's an example for us. That's something we're to follow. Here he specifically says, this is an example you're to follow. There's no reading into that. He tells us that if we are to follow him, if we are to be disciples of him, we are to serve. We are to humble ourselves. We are to put others ahead of us. Jesus also served with humility, and I think that's an important way for us to think about service, that service, true service, Christian service, Jesus' service didn't come out of pity. It wasn't because he felt bad for the people around the table. He didn't do it out of obligation. He didn't feel like he had to do it. He did it because he was humble and out of love. And in response, if we turn over to Matthew chapter 20, there's a situation there where the, the mother of John and James asked Jesus, when he returns in his glory, to put one at the right and one at the left. And in Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28, he, t he tells them, you don't know what you're asking for. He tells them, are you ready to drink the cup? They say they are. And then in Matthew 20, 26 to 28, it says, it is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus performs this service, performs this act in John chapter 13, and then later on he says to love each other even as I have loved you. I think what Jesus is commanding here is we're to have a humble, loving service, which expects nothing in return, which is what Martin Luther King was talking about with a, a agape love, which is a service that expects nothing. I think that's what Jesus' service looked like as well. And this is not only a steep call, not only a difficult call to follow, to have a humble and loving attitude towards service, but it's also a rarely answered one. If you look at society, there's very few that are willing to humble themselves and to love so much to serve without expecting anything in return. 
I read a very interesting article this, this past week, and it was talking about millennial parents. And it was giving some statistics, and I think, Troy, actually, you shared it first, because uh, my wife shared it, and then I read it. Um, but it was really interesting. Uh, and it was talking about, you know, if you look at the age group of millennials, that's 23 to 38. Um, and those are the ones with young kids right now. Millennials are the ones that are, are having children and, and are raising children. And it talked about how uh, millennial parents not going to church is a major reason why nurseries across the country are empty or barren, or there's only a few kids in them. I think if any of us have, have been around the church for a long time, we've seen full nurseries. We've seen where there was a, an abundance of kids in the congregation, not only here, but across the country. But that's not the case now. Some t statistics to back that up, only 2 in 10 of, under, of people under 30 believe attending church is important. 59% of millennials raised going to church have dropped out. I think we've seen that number here. I remember my youth group. Uh, if, if you think back, I was in a youth group of about 12 to 14 kids. Um, Christina moved away, so we'll give her an excuse. Uh, but but it's, I look around and I don't see those same people anymore. And that's true across countries, 59% have dropped out. 35% of millennials have an anti-church stance, believing that church and religion does more harm than good. If you've talked to many people, you've probably heard this, that religion causes wars, religion causes animosity, religion causes hate. And that's a, 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 an opinion that has become prevalent, especially within my age group. And the article presented some interesting ways to combat that, some interesting ways to try to fix it. One that stood out to me in particular with this subject matter in mind, and I may bring up others later, said we need to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And I think about my, my age group, and I think about the way we were raised to think. We were raised in the internet age. We saw everything. We had an abundance of information, and we were told consistently that we were able to change the world. We were able to make a difference because Technology allows me to reach people anywhere. I could walk out of here, call somebody in China, and talk to them about business or about religion or about politics. This, this interconnectivity has, has been entrenched in our society, especially with my age group. And it says we need to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And it said that millennials are not just interested in seeing a church merely exist. They're not okay with it just being here. They need it to do something. They need to see action, and that's how they will feel engaged and want to be a part of that activity. And the church definitely has the ability to do that. The church has the ability to change the world. Throughout history, the church has changed the world. But we have to be willing to show people that we're willing to get out there and do it. We're willing to get out there and serve. And when we serve in the appropriate way, when we serve with humble and a loving attitude, I think that will change the world. It's easy to look at the numbers that I stated and get discouraged. It's easy, especially for me, to look at my contemporaries and say, well, they're just lost. It's easy to look at the young people and say, well, they're just a godless people. They don't care. It doesn't matter what we do, because this is their attitude. And I don't think that's a, a way we should look at things, because when you look throughout history, especially when you look at Acts, and I remember when we studied Acts in the men's class on Wednesday nights, and it was fascinating to me how Paul, when he was talking to Athens and he was talking to Antioch, tailored his message to that people. It was all the truth. It was all God's word. But he met them where they were. And I think that's what we have to do if we want to reach people. We have to meet them where they are. And with that becomes a loving and humble service. If we want to reach people, if we want to, to get out there and show people that the church can make a difference, it comes through a humble and loving service. And when you think about why Paul did that, why did Paul tailor his message? Why didn't he just lay out the same sermon every time and say, look, it's up to them. I told them the truth. I told them what they had to do. It's up to them to respond, regardless of how I say it. And I think he tailored it because of his love for God and his love for people. Because he wanted to reach every single person. So he would try to reach them where they were, try to bring them up where they are, and bring them to the knowledge 
and love of God. So my response to, if we want to bring more people in, I think that we need to serve with love. And if we want to change the world, we need to serve everyone with love. If we want to follow the example of Jesus, we need to serve with love and humility. If we become that beloved community, if we become that, that vision that Martin Luther King laid out in that, in that quote, that will look different. That will stand out. That will make a difference, and that will pe make people take notice. That's that church that loves everybody. That's that church that serves the community. I think that will help us to stand out. And after John chapter 13, when Jesus is talking, he talks uh, to his disciples about many things. He continues to talk to them. He talks to them about his betrayal. He talks to them about his departure. He talks to them about the spirit that would come to them. And then if you flip over to John chapter 15, in verse 12, he repeats this command to them. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Again, speaking with that agape love, that selfless love that expects nothing in return, that sacrificial love. I think he repeats that command to him, not just because he forgot that he said it earlier, but he wanted to emphasize this. He wanted to say, this is how it should be known. Then he continues to talk, and he says, look, this is my commandment, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. And Jesus loved them by serving them and by being a servant to them, because he didn't come into the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many, as we read in Matthew 20. So I think if we're looking this year, and if we're ready to serve, I think if we have trouble thinking about, well, am I ready to serve? Am I ready to serve other people? Am I ready to serve as God has called me to? I think one of the things we need to reflect on and really think about is, how do we love? Are we loving other people as God has called us to love other people? Are we following the example of Jesus to love one another? Because if we are, I think we'll be ready for service. If we love as Jesus has loved, then we'll be ready to serve as he was ready to serve. And we come in contact with God's love and his mercy through baptism. The church is also here to love you. And in one moment, we'll stand and sing, and we'll give an opportunity to do that, to come forward if you need any prayers, or if you want to join in and have contact with God's love through baptism. But I wanted to leave you with another quote. And again, it's from the same person. It's from Martin Luther King. It says, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve in some capacity. All that you need is a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. And if we can help you in any way this morning to do that, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.